So I just had a brief question about Laura's. Uh, you, you got a slide there that uh, showed that the pocket wells break even was in the 50 ish dollar a barrel range. Yes. How is that adjusted for dry holes or it's greater learning about the play and where to drill? And so is there some kind of over optimization that we're seeing with that? Where that, we're that, looking at the best stuff and those are those are based on average wells from the top ten producers in the Bakken. Uh, their average wells at, that they drilled in the last sure. quarter. There is all fairly recent data. I don't. I've got. Data, can you hear me? I've got data going back uh, through the middle of last year. But what I showed on that slide was just from the second quarter of this year. So it's just it's an average. It's just a rough. Well, there, there are lots of wells in there that are very low rate and probably never even paid out their drilling costs. But this is an average of these offers. An average of the last quarter of drilling? Of the wells drilled in the last quarter by the top 10 operators in that play. Okay. Because, yeah. it, you know, as, as an investor, the investor proposition has to include all this other stuff, all the mistakes oh. you make. And so then, then the question of where, where the investment money comes in, what... What yeah, kind of yeah. I mean, you have to go back and do kind of a life cycle economic analysis of the whole play to come up with that. I did that for the Barnett, but I haven't done it on the Balkan yet. Okay. Thank but you. That, but you just have to. There's just an awful lot of scatter in that data too. So. I'm sure you guys have all seen the famous wedge of hope slide from the 2009 EIA report. And it shows, as I'm sure you're all familiar, a decline from present production all the way down to $43 million, million barrels per day from present resources, leaving a shortfall of 60 million barrels per day. So what I don't understand about the earlier presentation is clearly the Bakken's a big deal. It's got to be good for maybe 5 million barrels a day if we really develop it over time. Where does the other 55 million barrels per day come from? Or is this chart wrong? And if it's wrong, how did it get to be wrong? And why hasn't that been discussed? Do you want me to answer it? Or I mean, I'll start, I'll start it. Yeah, I mean, I, I never showed, I, I didn't show 55 million barrels a day. I showed four and a half million barrels a day for all of the shale plays in the United States and Canada. Um, and the total production in the United States has been, has been pointed out right now is about 6.3 million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. And so and by 2020, what, what my forecast shows is that the shale plays will be contributing 4.5 million barrels a day. I don't know what the total U.S. production will be at that time because I haven't made that analysis. Um, so I, 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 the, the one thing I, I absolutely agree with Art Berman on is the United States is not going to become energy independent not from shale oil or anything else. But it is, it is a resource and it is helpful to have that production in this country. It's, a, it's created a lot of jobs and a lot of economic activity and it will improve our, our trade balance, so. So I appreciate your patience with our little technology uh, transfer, but I'm going to, um, or transition I should say, uh, but let's go ahead with our program and let's, let's some, some synth synthesizing comments by Dr. Pasek. And uh, then we'll go back to our to our interplay of the panel. I think everyone should be lavaliers at that, that by that point. Go ahead. Well, um, so so it's difficult to synthesize, you know, the three the four talks, including Bob Persh's talk, in two sentences, because you saw there was a wealth of information, and that not all of the conclusions or even interpretation of the facts, the prior production, were equal. So you could see that there is a divergence of opinion uh, and of approach among the experts because you know, we, we are talking about experts. Um, I can see with some pleasure that Art is to the far left from me and Scott is to the left. Uh, I never expected that to happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but I must say that even though I'm to the right, uh, you know, with respect to Scott, uh, I, I don't feel as optimistic about increasing uh, the global petroleum production uh, by these millions and millions of barrels, 
yeah, I think that at best we'll be trying to offset the declines of the existing fields and at some point, and I think that point is coming very quickly, we will not be able to stem the decline even with all the new projects. Um, and while our work on gas shales, and I will be working on oil shales pretty soon, and we have done extremely detailed studies, let's say, of the Bakken shale, and, and Scott is the leader on that project, uh, there will be a very significant volume of gas uh, that I believe, and there will be some volume of oil, and I tend to believe, to agree a little bit more with art on the side of caution. Uh, these wells are very expensive, uh, they require a lot of resources to put in uh, and in fact uh, in the North Dakota we're talking today about water availability as simple as that and therefore some of the projected increases of production may not materialize to the extent that some of the experts hope. And so that's where I am. But, but I would like to kind of refocus this discussion because we were going to talk about the uh, American energy independence and I would like first uh, to ask each of the panelists to define uh, what he or she means when they say energy independence and then answer in one sentence, do I believe that that will happen soon or ever uh, or I don't and we'll pick up from there and we'll let the audience to take some steps at us. So thank you very much. Let's start from Art. So, you know, what is energy independence and, and do you believe it's going to happen? You may want to pick the phone or turn it on. Okay, well, it is on. There oh, okay. um, Energy independence means never having to say you're sorry. It's uh, Eric Siegel, I guess. But you, you may want to pick the phone like this. All right. Energy independence means that you. We've got really good technology here. Uh, it, it means that you can produce as much of you as you consume mm -hmm. of whatever form of energy you're talking about. So I had a slide that says today we consume about 15 million barrels of crude oil in the United States. We produce more than six. So crude oil independence means we got to come up with another nine. If we're talking about natural gas, we're using 60 some odd billion feet a day. Uh, we're more or less independent on gas right now. So it, it just depends. But um, my view is, is, as I've said before, that uh, and, and I'm glad to hear Laura agrees, while we will increase our production some, we will not be energy independent because it's just completely statistically unlikely that I've never seen a basin or a country go back to greater than peak production. I mean, it could happen. I could live to be 500 too, but um, it never has happened before. We've got an awful lot of history and data on this. So that's, that's what I think. Same definition. Um, I'm, I, test, I remember I testified in the Senate about six years ago, and the hearing was on energy independence. And my first sentence was, we can't be. So it didn't make me very popular there uh, among that group. But I've kind of started to eat my words. I actually wrote an op-ed for CNN just a month or two ago saying maybe I was wrong. And they said, nobody ever admits they're wrong in print. You, know, you need to if you are. So I said, maybe I was wrong. Maybe we can be energy independent, North America. What would that mean? It means you can produce more energy than you can consume. Oil, I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, I think even in the liquids, it's probably unlikely. But there's the challenge Bob laid out very well that we like dense fuels in our tanks. Liquids are dense fuels. They store forever. You can drive. And that's what we like, that's what our technology is, and the world is following that. So there's this challenge of getting liquids. That's really the big challenge to me on that front, is how do you replace liquids with something else, whether it's electrons or, or some set of hybrids or hydrogen or, or other liquids. You know, is it biofuels, is it LNG, is it, is it I, I call it you know, the gas conversion project in the Canadian oil sands. It's, that's gas to liquids, right? You're burning gas to make heat to bring really thick gunk. That's the density of a hockey puck. Of course, it's hockey puck. It's Canada, you know. But you bring that to the surface and make it sludgy enough to flow and add more methane and heat and go refine it. So it's a gas to liquids conversion because we need liquids. 
I don't think we'll be, um, I'm not a big fan of independence right now. I think trade is actually healthy. So philosophically, I'm not, a, I don't think it's, I don't panic as much about energy independence as others do. I've written that. I actually think trade is reasonably healthy for the world. Um, so, you know, I, I, but I'm not, I'm also not a panic guy. I don't, I feel that uh, price and technology and human ingenuity and when faced with crisis, um, reasonably, we respond reasonably well to that. So I agree with almost everything Art said. I think the, the thing where we might depart is I think that that many wells will be drilled and some people will lose money and they'll get bought by other companies um, and we'll continue to evolve technology and we'll go to dry fracks and we'll use recycled water. The, part, the cost of wells will come down a little bit and this kind of thing until such time as you can get a more affordable substitute for those liquids because we love driving vehicles in this world. So I actually think probably, again, until those things happen, that many wells will be drilled. And, and some of the density drilling studies show that in fact more can be drilled in the better rock. I also agree it's not a big continuous reservoir. Uh, uh, we've looked at that. Um, but again, there's, there is capacity in places that people thought there wasn't capacity. And, and we've shared some of our results with Art on that too. So I think there's a lot of learning going on. Yeah, I have no difference in the definitions of energy independence either. Um, just, I want to address one point Scott made a little bit further in the Bakken. Uh, we have, we have, uh, we've mapped out the locations of all those wells over the company's acreage maps in the Bakken. And there are just, in, in those core areas, in those nice, those nice green spots on, on Art's map, there are, there are lots and lots and lots of well locations left in there. They've just, and, and granted it's expensive, it's capital intensive, but they've, they've done it so far. And I don't, see, I don't see any reason to expect that for some reason they're all gonna run out of money or they're not gonna be able to drill these wells. But I, I actually think they will be drilled. And that's why our forecasts show the Bakken production rising a bit more and then leveling off. I, I, it's not gonna get, it's not going to get to huge levels. It's not going to make two million barrels a day or anything like that, but it will continue to grow. But as far as uh, just from a policy standpoint, I get disturbed by all this talk about American energy independence um, because I think it just leads to a lot of what Scott, or what Art rather rightfully called magical thinking. Um, when the reality is, is I think our policymakers need to prepare, especially the American public, for higher energy prices in the future and provide them alternatives other than driving great big cars just to take your children to school, for example. That, that's, what, that's where I see the real danger in all of this talk about energy independence because it's just, it's not real and it's leading to very bad policies. Yeah, at the risk of uh, agreeing with each other too much, um, I, I will take issue. God, I, I understand what, where Scott's coming from on the Barnett Shale, uh, but the Balkan, I, I, I can't agree with, with what you said there, Laura. I mean, there have been three significant fields found in the Balkan in the last 10 years. The first was Elm Cooley. It went into decline after six years. It continues to decline. Uh, the next field discovered was Sanish. It looks like it'll be about the thir a third of the production of Elm Cooley. It went into decline after three years. Parshall is in terminal decline, and they've drilled, they found the limits of the field, and there's nothing left to drill. Okay, I, I, I wanna. I want to kind of cut it off at this because we, we can spend the whole day and uh, show you a lot of maps discussing these things. But I want to give uh, our audience a chance to participate because I know how active the audience is in such meetings. So, uh, uh, Hans, since I know you, <laughs> let's start from Hans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or speak loudly. Yes, uh, I would be uh, asking uh, you, the panel, to comment, please, on something I see as sort of an irony. To explain that in a little more detail, I was triggered by the slide of all the drilling activity going on in the Barnett Shales. That was yeah. really a very powerful thing. It strikes me that 
capital wants to be employed as, so to speak, in sort of people. And so here you have this story here, right, right in Texas. A, a good news story from an economic standpoint, because you have all this economic activity and a lot of jobs associated directly with the drilling and supplying all this stuff, which is occurring in effect because uh, drilling has become less efficient. You get less oil per foot of well drilled. You get less oil per uh, foot of steel put in the ground and things like that. So it's, it's sort of an ironic thing that's going, as I see it, it's sort of an ironic thing going on here that um, in search of a fluid, which we use to save labor, save effort, the, uh, from a, right now the economics here look good because it's a less uh, we're, we're having to put more labor in and more capital in to get the stuff up. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, efficiency is a, is a good way to describe it. Uh, if, you know, in those terms that you define, I wouldn't argue with those. The cost of energy has risen. I just got a slide sent to me yesterday on this. Uh, you know, inflation adjusted, it's gone up like 200 and something percent in the last four decades. And then food and some other things were much higher and other things were lower. It's set kind of right in the middle, the cost of energy driven by, uh, in part by efficiency, if you, if you define it as a foot of steel for a molecule out. Um, given the rock quality, rock, or called it crap rock or whatever, you know, I'm not gonna argue with that. In the, in the sense, you know, we used to core shales in the, uh, in the 80s. If you took a shale core, you got fired. <laughs> you, know, you lost your job because uh, you missed your, the real reservoir. Now everybody wants to look at those. So these are, these are the seals. You know, these are not good rocks in the sense that we conventionally define them. Turns out there is a lot of storage in them though. It's just at a much smaller level. So I think technologically you're on the front end of some things that Tad's department and ours and others out there are trying to understand to become more efficient. How do you get a pressure drawdown at the interface to let things flow to that well more more easily? What does permeability really look like? Can you get a well out there that cracks the rock more efficiently so you can get more flow for less steel and less metal? Can we put less metal in? Can we put no liquids in, fewer chemicals? They're on the front end of some things here. So we can, I bet in 20, 25 years, we'll look back and say, wow, we did things really stupid in the early 2010s with horizontal drilling and hydrofracking that was dumb. And we look back 50 years in the conventional world and some of the things that used to get done there we look at today and say, wow, that's kind of old stuff. So I do think that technology evolves and our capacity to understand its evolution is good but not great. That's why our forecasts are often not great. I would like to go to the next question because I know there's tons of questions. I'll start from the front, and then I'll go to the back. Yes. Come on, Omar. <laughs> Omar actually is a student in my class, so the students are here. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for being on the panel. I have a very short question, which is on the topic of fracking. What do you think is the most effective argument to stop fracking? On a, in, in, in what sense? Well, for example, in Michigan, there's a lawsuit. For example, in Michigan, there's a lawsuit to ban fracking right. on all state lands. Yeah. And there are many people who are activists who are involved in trying to stop fracking, especially in state parks. Sure. Uh, so what is the most effective argument oh, on the other side? To stop fracking. I, I think it's... Uh, the, the best argument to stop fracking is so we can uh, live by candlelight. We can, you know, return to a canticle for <laughs> Leibowitz uh, or the Hunger Games. Um, <laughs> glad, glad Art's answering this one. <laughs> if, you're, if you're willing to, if you're willing to change your life, and Tad, if you're willing to live like people do in, you know, in, in, in poorly developed countries, um, then fine. Let's stop fracking. And in fact, Michigan may not be far from that, but... <laughs> uh, that just got streamed to CNN. Uh, so here's what I say to students. 
because we looked in this film, it's in Switch, at kind of all the alternatives. And I, so I go to the places that I know are going to be a challenge. I've been to Rensselaer, I've been to Duke, I've been to Berkeley, I've been to University of Michigan, where I got a degree, actually, and University of Colorado, where Earthman came and watched the film. And, 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 and so the, they say, we don't like fracking. And I say, that's fine. If you don't like fracking, you must like nuclear. And they say, well, no, we don't, we don't like nuclear. I said, well, then you love coal. <laughs> we don't like coal. I said, well, do you like electricity? Yeah, it's a necessary evil we can all agree to, usually. So I come back and say, well, you can't not like everything. Well, we like wind and solar, and maybe they do, maybe they don't, as long as they don't have to look at it. But we talk about the scale and the challenges of, of where it is and how, what it's going to take to grow it and come back to base load power, coal, natural gas, and nuclear. You can't not like everything. So the best argument to me to stop fracking I was taking a little bit larger would be, is there a, an affordable alternative? And if people push me with climate change, which I, I believe actually man is helping to cause, I'll say we can address that today. There's technology today to address that. Let's go full scale nuclear globally, quickly. And they don't like that solution quite often, or that, even that proposition. Lots of reasons not to like it, particularly plutonium. And I say, well, let's go thorium. In fact, why doesn't the US go to Iran today and offer to build for them 10 new thorium nuclear reactors, which don't make plutonium, and see if they're really serious about making electricity or weapons? Let's start to call some bluffs. Okay? And, and so then it quickly becomes, well, I, I really don't like climate change, but I don't like nuclear more. You can't not like everything. So that's the biggest argument to me for stopping fracking is an alternative. And I think you could look at Germany, I'm talking too much, but you could look at Germany as a model and say, what are they going to do? Moratorium on fracking, moratorium on nuclear. Guess what they're producing now? And Germany is a clean thinking country. They love wind and solar, they just don't have much of it. All right? the, the solar intensity is like Seattle, the wind isn't so great. They're going to brown coal, lignite. Yeah, and then, in, and, and dear Mr. Putin, please send methane. I don't think that can last. So the best argument to me is, is there an affordable, scalable alternative or not? And then let's talk about it. Yeah, I, I can't top that. That was excellent. There are, you, you cannot not like everything. So that's a very good point. <laughs> and I presume that most people like to shower. Um, next question then, please. <laughs> How would your views on energy independence change if the U.S., through a major change in public policy, reduced oil consumption by, say, 400,000 to 600,000 barrels per day for a 20-year period? In fact, the United States has been doing it for the last three years. We've been essentially lowering our consumption of oil by about 500,000 barrels per year uh, over the last three years. So this has been happening. But I let my panel answer these questions. Well, I think the best way to, uh, to reduce consumption is to promote worldwide depression. Um, and, well, no, it really does work. Um, and, 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 and part of the reason that the US is using less oil in the last three years is because the economy sucks. And, and so, you know, we, we can either regulate it or we can just make sure, print more money as we're doing, and, and that'll accomplish the same end. Let's go ahead and switch sides, Art. Right? You come over here on the right. <laughs> you, can, you can narrow the gap with better. There's still a lot of extreme inefficiencies in our use of oil in this country. So with the, with the right policies and um, the right attitude, I think we could continue to reduce our oil consumption without necessarily remaining in a recession. Um, but uh, I don't think, it's just, it would just take something to me that's not realistic to completely close the gap. I, uh, I've looked at some nations that made deliberate public policy decisions to reduce oil consumption. And the rate appears to be about 2% per year without any economic stress or disruption. Uh, Denmark, France, nations like this have reduced oil consumption just through public policy. 
Which leads me to a question I want to ask of the audience uh, and the panel. Okay, so definitely we do not want to uh, strangle the economy and we do not want to cause undue hardship on the citizens. Yet, we do have to come up with alternatives to liquid transportation fuels and of course Bob's analysis is absolutely spot on. So what are these alternatives and would electricity, let's say from a variety of sources uh, through trains and light rail and other solutions, uh, uh, deliver such an opportunity? So I want to kind of switch the subject and now look at good ways of reducing consumption of petroleum without causing a global depression. Um, there, there's a question there in the back in the middle. Um, so I guess we need a mic. Uh, so I, I want just to challenge a bit the fact that you know we have to necessarily move away from liquid uh, fuels because and, and this relates to the question I had earlier is how do you feel about the natural gas to liquid uh, process because you know we think of energy and, and what's important in creating uh, energy paradigm shifts is essentially technology shifts and we've seen lateral drilling uh, enhanced imaging techniques and fracking create a paradigm shift in the way we extract hydrocarbons, but it hasn't been oil, as the evidence all of you produce, it has been natural gas. This is where we have seen the biggest rise in, 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 in production. So if we manage to transform uh, the, the, the gains we have made in, in natural gas into you know, liquid fuels, and, and this is, an, or if we have a lot of coal into you know, coal to liquid. So the coal to liquid or liquid or natural gas to liquid technology is a viable alternative if there is an additional technological shift which allows the, the return of energy investment to be uh, you know, low enough or high enough um, to you know, be economically viable. But I think this is a route that would allow to preserve you know, our infrastructure and the, the, the way our economy is built, especially in the United States, because we are not Denmark, we are not France, we don't work that way. We consume a lot of fuel. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the possibility of, of uh, GTL technology or CTL technology to you know, fix things? I'm really not a, a big fan of retrograde technologies. Um, you know, the Fisher Trove process is nothing new. Uh, the reason that it didn't go anywhere in the past was because it costs a ton of money and is very inefficient. And if you don't like a windmill in your yard, I guarantee you won't want a, a gas to liquids facility in your backyard. So um, the big problem, I think, is you know we're, we're trying to go back to the, well, in that case, we're trying to go back to the early 1900s. In the case of wind and solar, we're trying to go back to either the Middle Ages or you know, ancient history. And I'm, I'm with Scott on this. I, I think we have, to, we have to focus on, I mean, we, we can do all that stuff, but uh, talk to the Sierra Club about natural gas. I mean, you know, they, 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 they've loved, they, they gotta hate something. Maybe they hate everything, but uh, they're as down on natural gas as they are on fracking. And uh, so, you know, this, this is, the, this is the, the noise that's out there. So I think we, I think we need to focus on what we can control and what we can control is our behavior. And we can and buy ourselves time for those technologies by consuming less and not have it regulated, but have it be a personal choice because it works better for us. And, and I would like to, to kind of upfront dispel the notion that gas to liquids and coal to liquids is going to solve all our problems. Especially coal to liquids is an enormously inefficient and dirty technology which requires 10 barrels of water per barrel of uh, the liquid, sort of the waxy crude that you obtain by fischer tropsch um, synthesis. And so uh, you're going to create to mount mountains of waste, use water where you have no water, like in Montana, and, and produce very little fuel for it. So I don't think that's a good alternative. You can run a war machine for a while, uh, as, as the Germans did with great efficiency, but you, and the South Africans did because they had restrictions uh, for importing fuel, but you can't really run world economy on this concept. So, so I want to, to, be in, to, to kind of steer the discussion more towards, okay, so if it's not gas to liquids, if it's not coal to liquids, 
and if the oil supply perhaps is not increasing as some might wish, what are we going to do here? Okay, so I, I'm just challenging the audience to come up with questions along these lines, or challenge me. Yes, to, on, on, the, on my right, which is on the left. Uh, I'd like to put a question for Laura, uh, and it's a reinforcement of what Art said, and I think it's the, the resolution, whatever way it goes, to these... No, it probably doesn't need one. It's a resolution, perhaps, to the tension between the different people that we have. And it's, it's a very simple thing, Laura. Um, I'm moving to Montana. My wife and I drove across the country uh, to our new house for my retirement. And we thought, well, let's go through Parcel. Um, and I have a graduate student, Egan, who will be talking, I think, at lunch about uh, this uh, field. But I saw some things out of my car window, and I have pictures of them here, that were so bloody obvious that seemed to me to totally reinforce art and not reinforce your perspective. And it's this. We entered the Bakken uh, formation. We drove for 100 miles. We saw grass, antelope, corn occasionally. And then we came to the town of Parsal. We had not seen a single oil rig, uh, maybe one. And then we went three miles west of the town of Parsal, and then there were oil wells uh, every, I don't know, half mile or so, uh, pump jacks and so forth, all, as far as you could see around the horizon. And we went uh, through extraordinarily intense oil development, uh, sometimes many uh, rigs at one place, and then we went 25 miles more, and there were none. So this is the sweet spot concept, which was so bloody obvious. Then we would, drove across the Bakken seeing maybe five oil wells. And so it's very, very obviously a sweet spot, and there are wells at least every mile apart, which is the reach of the horizontal uh, situation. So are there other sweet spots? And if there aren't sweet spots, you look at the, the output of the wells, the few wells that they have drilled out of the uh, sweet spots, and there's very, very low yielding wells. So how would you answer that question? I, I get the picture. Um, well, from the thing, you can't, you can't assume that because you go through an area where there are a bunch of wells, that I, it, it, it takes time to drill these wells. You can't assume because there's an area that's all drilled up, there's nothing else there. Maybe they just haven't gotten to it yet. And wells that are a half mile apart, I mean, these wells could go down to 80 acres spacing. Nobody really knows the drainage area of these wells yet very well. And so a half a mile spacing is huge. There's a lot of potential to drill what they call infill drilling in between these locations and pick up oil that the existing wells don't even touch. So I don't think you can, I mean, I, I know it looks like, it looks terrible. You just see all these pump jacks and it looks like everything's there that could ever go there, but that's not, that's not necessarily the case. And, and until, until the industry really understands how much how much of that rock line were actually drained by these wells. You really don't know what the, what the ultimate economic well spacing is going to be. You don't even know if you drill a well in between two existing wells. You can't even necessarily say it's going to be a lower rate. Uh, you just don't know. There have been some wells that have been drilled that have not been lower rates, and some of them have been better than the two wells on either side of it. So. Um, you, you, you can't make a conclusion like that. There's still a lot to be learned about these shales. There's no doubt about it. But the conclusion that you can make, the conclusion that you can make in partial is it's got one operator, and that's EOG, and the performance of wells has deteriorated with every successive year. And if we make the assumption that EOG is a competent operator, I'll show you a map of wells drilled in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, and I'll show you the 
the declines on those wells, they have found the limits of that field. Can they infill? Okay. Absolutely they can, but the field isn't going to get any bigger geographically. So I agree with your comments, but assuming EOG is a competent operator, they're getting worse results yeah, every year. I've seen exactly the same thing with EOG as well. I have only five minutes, so uh, more questions. In, uh, in the back. <laughs> in the back. <laughs> yes, you are back. Okay. <laughs> One of the questions that we've touched on, but we haven't really addressed. We talk about the break-even cost. That's the break-even cost to drill, explore, to find, to drill dry holes. Is it $50, $70, $50, But We haven't talked about what is the price of oil that it has to stay at in order to maintain this type of drilling activity. The price is the important thing. I used to think it was two to one over the break-even cost. If that's true, you know, we need $100. So the question is, if the forecast of some people who say it will be $75 next year, uh, will all that drilling come to a screeching halt? There's not much profit left if you're paying $70. Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. But we, we assume for our forecast that oil prices are going to be at a constant dollar ninety dollars a barrel. So if your break-even price for your well is $50 a barrel, you still got a fair amount of uh, room there. Um, but again, as I've said, not all of those wells are economic. And the only way these companies can stay in business is to drill more economic wells than non-economic. So, um, yeah, it, it is an issue, and the oil price might have to rise quite a bit more in order to sustain this level of drilling. It's an interesting point. <coughs> I just want to touch on that real quick. But it's a good point. I think there's an interesting tension, and it was mentioned earlier, supply and demand. If oil gets down to $70 a barrel, we either had some combination of energy enlightenment where we use less, which I hope has happened. That's what switch really is about and demand destruction from economic recessions or other kinds of things, not such a good, and other things that can pull that demand down. And or supply has come up. And because 70 bucks a barrel means there's not as much demand supply ratio going on there. And, and so that in part has some good components to it. It means there'll be less drilling. And you know the cycle, I won't repeat it. Um, but in that oil is a little bit more globally fungible than certainly natural gas, it does tend to respond to more of that global dynamic a little bit. Now there's obviously perturbations in that that can be put on by major suppliers. Natural gas is harder. It, well, uh, the lady in, in the, okay, well, no, no. So, so let's ask the question, but let's now be brief because we only have a couple of minutes. So. Fast question, fast answer. Yeah, just, just real quick. So, so the overall theme in everybody's presentation is that energy is getting more expensive, right? It's not, it's not staying cheap. So as energy gets more expensive over the years, it, it operates as a energy tax on the economy. So that puts a, basically, we're not gonna see more economic growth if with energy prices rise, right? So how do we get out of our current economic malaise if energy prices will rise as demand rises, correct? So. Go ahead. I don't want to keep it. Yeah. Well, it's a differential thing. So if energy prices rise in one ge uh, geopolitical region and not another, there's, there's global growth that comes from that. Um, if, if it's more, and that's part of the reason a lot of things don't move forward in geopolitics, particularly carbon prices and other things, is there's a differentiating impact on geopolitical regions. So, so it's tough to say if things, if energy prices rise, when natural gas here is three bucks and it's 12 to 13 in China, and oil different in Venezuela and, and Saudi Arabia than it is in, in Denmark. Uh, so there, it, it, it's, a, that's a tough, it's a tough question when you look at it that way as a, as a global rise or fall. I don't think it really actually functions that way that often. 
So economies are healthy in some parts of the world today when ours might not be. It behaves in the aggregate together, but certainly lots of differential things going on. Andrew, what the, there's a lady in the, in the uh, red coat, yes. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I think in the last couple of days, there's been a news item about uh, someone who was wanted to put in a crude oil pipeline from the Baca, couldn't even get subscriptions for 200,000 barrels a day for a pipeline, so they scrapped that idea. That would seem to kind of indicate that the producers are not really behind the view of the long-term growth. Uh, also, I was just going to comment that, of course, the cost of transporting this oil, if you don't have a pipeline, is quite a bit higher, and you really have to factor that into the $50 a barrel or whatever figure you're talking about. That's a good point. Uh, responsible for taking most of that oil out by, by rail. And uh, they pointed out that the, the, the operators have uh, really started to see the advantage of rail transport because it gives them flexibility as to where they send the oil, whereas a pipeline does not. And so they have, if, if price is better in California, they send it to California. If price is better in Illinois, they send it to Illinois. So. Some of that, I think, is due to the flexibility that, that rail provides. Just an interesting insight that I didn't have. Somebody asked me to talk, and that was the answer. Uh, we've also been uh, looking at the crude by rail and the infrastructure issues in the Balkan, and, uh, and it's true. I, my, my brother works for an oil field construction company. He's doing a project in the Balkan now, and it's a big oil gathering system. Um, and all it's going to do is take all this company's oil to a rail loading terminal because they would prefer to send it by rail for the reasons that Art just mentioned. It's more flexible and it really, um, it really, because of the flexibility, you can actually end up with a better price at your wellhead sometimes. So there's a lot of crude oil being shipped by rail now. That's also happening in Canada. There's a lot of Canadian crude oil coming down to, especially the Gulf Coast, by rail. And one of the cost advantages is they don't have to put as much condensate in it to ship it by rail as they have to do to ship it by pipeline. So there's a lot of really crazy things going on. on this. And Warren Buffett likes rail, so yes. the president does as well. Uh, okay, so, so we have only two minutes, so I would like to have somebody with a tough burning question. I, I can see two people on my right. <laughs> Given that the organizations like Rocky Mountain Institute and the uh, American uh, ACEEE say that we're wasting 50 to 90 percent of the energy that we use and burn. What or how can energy efficiency play into uh, gaining some time or some uh, closeness to <coughs> independence? This is more for Scott Tinker. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a big fan of efficiency. There's obvious rebound effects and things, but I still think in the aggregate, it, it, we just need to change the way we think about energy and start to think about it. And so across the board, whether it's lighting or insulation or vehicles or it, you know, uh, just a whole suite of things that we can do, particularly in the developed West here in North American West, uh, in the way we change and use energy, it doesn't change your lifestyle. It doesn't, um, you know, so these are, these are things that just require some level of education, um, some early investment, I think it can make good, uh, this is a case where good industrial government partnerships can trigger things and uh, drive um, consumption to go down in a positive way rather than in other economic ways. And there's a whole list of things. I, I think it's time for us to wrap up and I will only say that it, oh, there's one more last question. Okay, very good. Um, you know, markets and technology seem to be the most important player here. But what about uh, federal or state policy and things that you see really are impediments now or other new ideas that might help from policy? And, uh, and the interesting thought, secondly, on the uh, oil being shipped by railroads versus pipeline, any kind of metric on the difference in cost of that? So two quick ones. Well, as to the first part of your question, I mean, everybody should read Bob Hirsch's book. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, zingers in there, and, and I, I, I subscribe to many of them. The one I like the best is that 
Uh, whenever government chooses winners and losers in energy, it results in huge mistakes and costs us all a lot of money. So I, I think government, they don't know anything about energy. I mean, that's the problem. That's why we have presidential candidates either telling us ignorance or lies. Um, but I'll let Laura talk some more about the rail. Yeah, okay, just one other thought on the policy. I think that the governments can provide incentives for people to do the right things if they're done properly. Um, I, I don't like mandates. I don't like the government picking technologies. It doesn't work at all. But they can, they can provide incentives for, uh, or they can, or they can in force the increase in fuel economy of cars. I think that's fine. They can give. They can provide public transportation and alternatives for people, so they don't have to drive anywhere. There's a lot of things government can do besides just picking winners and losers or coming up with these crazy mandates. On the rail, um, just some of the costs on the rail, I, uh, some of this is just anecdotal evidence from, or numbers from conversations that I've had, but, but I, I do know one thing, uh, the, just the, the Canadian oil sands oil, it costs about, condensate is very expensive in Alberta right now because of the demand and the shortage of supply. So it costs these producers roughly $30 for every barrel of bitumen they produce. It costs them $30 to blend condensate into that. And you can ship crude oil by rail. You might, it might cost you maybe $10 to blend it to the, to the specs that you need to put it in a rail car. And you can ship it from Canada to the Gulf Coast of the United States for somewhere around $14 a barrel. And so just just the savings and the blending costs of well more than makes up for the cost of the rail. The pipeline shipments, I don't know, they're they're six, seven, eight dollars a barrel, so they're not real cheap either. So so there there are there are some advantages. Now the, the advantage in the Bakken is that the pipelines all end up in Cushing, Oklahoma, and then this crude oil ends up in Cushing, Oklahoma, and there's no place for it to go. So they end up having to truck it out of there or keep it in storage and if they just put it in a rail car up in North Dakota, they can ship it wherever they want to go. They can they can get it to market. They don't have to worry about the bottlenecks and cushion. You remember the movie uh, The Graduate? So yeah. they got in Dustin Hoffman. I'm going to say one word. You know, plastics. <laughs> so government. I'm going to say one word. Storage. <laughs> Governments invest in the storage. Storage changes the world of energy. I, I think it's time for us to wrap up, and I would like to thank you, the distinguished panel, Laura, Scott, and Art, for being so eloquent. And I think it's ready to um, go and get something to drink. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye.